If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke. For it was the Lord's will to put them to death. So Hophni and Phineas were having sex with the woman who served near the entrance of the temple. And the people were talking about it. And when Eli confronted his sons, they did not want to listen to him. Now God has designed sex for it is he who said be fruitful and multiply. But he designed sex to be experienced in the context of marriage between a man and a and a woman. So in Genesis 2 verse 24 it reads, Therefore, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Ephesians 5 31 says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Hebrews 13 4 says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled but warmongers and adulterers God will judge. Exodus 20 14 says thou shalt not commit adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is a sexual sin between someone who is married and someone they are not married to. Right? And also 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 it says flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What is fornication? Fornication is sexual immorality or sexual wrongness. This can include sex between persons who are not married, homosexuality, incest, which is sex between close family members, or sex with animals. All of these are considered to be wrong according to Leviticus 18. So Hophni and Phineas were sinning against God by sleeping with the woman at the entrance of the temple. Today we live in a culture, we live in a culture that glorifies sexual sin. Have you been, are you aware? In the dancehall culture, men are encouraged to have a whole lot of women, have sex with a whole lot of women. And women are encouraged to have sex with a whole lot of men. Men are encouraged to take away a boy girl. And, and women are encouraged to take away a woman's man. So there is no regard uh, to marriage and doing things God's way. And this is a problem in our society. Amen? Yeah. Not only that. But even the students in schools, they are being pressured by their classmates and peers to engage in sexual activities. Students are made to feel even strange or weird if they are not engaging in sexual activity, like they are wrong for not doing so. But we don't have to give in to the temptations of the world. By the help of God, we can live a life of purity and wait until marriage to have sex. And for those that are married, you can remain faithful to your spouse with God. God's help we can flee from these temptations but at the same time it is important that we don't put ourselves in positions that would make it harder to resist temptation not true for example if you're single and dating you can go out in groups or try to remain in public spaces don't go each up in any corner in any dark corner right right and so we have so 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 we have looked at the sins of the sons the first sin was that they did not show reverence to God's offering. And the second one is that they slept with the women who were at the entrance of the temple. Eli confronted them about their sins, but it was too late. They did not listen to him, for their hearts were hardened. Somebody say, too late. Now, for, now that we've looked at the sins of the sons, what's the second thing we're going to look at? Somebody is following. The sound of God's voice. So now that we've looked at the sins of the sons, now let us look at the sound of God's voice. One thing we learn from the scriptures is that God is able to speak to his people. Amen? He's not like the idols that are made of wood and metal that have mouth and cannot speak. We see where God spoke to Noah. And what did he say to Noah? He told Noah to build a an ark because there was going to be a flood and we see where God spoke to Moses and and helped him to lead the children of Israel out of where out of bondage or out of Egypt right let's take a look at numbers 12 verses 5 to 8 and we see something pretty interesting that God says about Moses 
That's Numbers 12, verses 5 to 8. It says, Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And we pause there. So we see that God is able to speak to us through dreams and visions, right? Not only that, but he is also able to speak in a way where we can lit he can literally be heard. And this was how the Lord spoke to Samuel. But before we look at the Lord speaking to Samuel, it's interesting to note that before the Lord spoke to Samuel, he had spoken to a prophet and this prophet spoke to Eli. Did anybody know that? That before the Lord spoke through Samuel, a prophet actually came to email Eli with a similar message. Let's take a look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 27 to 36. 1 Samuel 2 verses 27 to 36. It says... So in this, in this passage, we are going to see where a man of God came to Eli and prophesied to him what was that God was going to judge his family. Let's look what it says. It says, Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the ephod, which was a special garment, in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? And why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourself on the choices or the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that members of your family would minister before me forever, but now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be despised. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age, and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although, although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phineas will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread. And plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. So this man of God, we can end here. This man of God, he got a word from the Lord for Eli. And it was a word of judgment on Eli's family because of the sins of his sons. He said that they scorned God's sacrifice and they were off and offering, and, 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 and that Eli honored his sons more than how he honored God. He said that what would happen to both of Eli's sons? That they would do what? They would die on the same what? On the same day. And so this word, God would later confirm by, um, through Samuel. This is the word that he's going to confirm through Samuel. Let's take a look at it. 1 Samuel 3 verses 1 to 17. 
So it says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. So Samuel was there sleeping in that place, right? Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Again, the Lord called. Somebody say Samuel. Samuel. Yes, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called. Somebody say Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at other times. Somebody say, Samuel. 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 Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid. Somebody say afraid. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. So in this passage, we see where the Lord confirmed the prophetic word through Samuel. So the, the, the man came and declared the word, and now God chose, um, used Samuel to confirm the word. Sometimes God will send a word, and then he will confirm the word through various means. Do you remember Gideon? When God told Gideon that he was going to deliver the people from the Midianites, and Gideon said, me, little me going to deliver the people from the Midianites. And Gideon said, God, if I, you really attack to me, I go and lay a fleece before you. So it was like a piece of, of wool or animal fur. And he said, I'm going to spread it out before you on the ground, on the threshing floor. And God, if it's really you, I talk to me, I tell myself, hey, God, deliver the people from the Midianites. I want you to make the fleece wet by a morning and around it dry. And when Gideon went to sleep and wake up back and he went out, guess what happened? The fleece was wet. And he was able to wring out a bowl full of water out of it. And then Gideon said, all right, Lord. Look like you are talking to me, you know. But, but just to make sure, I want another confirmation. If it's really you talking to me, this time, make the fleece dry and around it wet. And he went to bed. And when he wake up back, guess what he saw? The fleece was dry and around it was wet. Just as how... Um, he requested. So God is able to confirm his word. Even this message for today, 
God would have confirmed through various sermons and people that I came in contact with for the last few days. There were times I wanted to choose a different passage to speak from. But God kept pointing me back to this text. So God is able to confirm his word. Amen? Amen. So we see where in the beginning also that Samuel did not know the voice of God. And he thought it was who? Eli. He thought it was Eli that was calling him. But Eli was able to offer guidance to Samuel. So that Samuel could hear the message that God wanted to tell him. So, so it is that God expects the older and more mature believers to guide the younger ones and the new believers into this path of spiritual growth. So those who operate in areas of gifting, you should offer guidance and mentorship to those who are younger or less experienced in this field. Those who serve in a ministry in the church should seek to offer guidance to those who are upcoming in that ministry or those who have an interest in that ministry. This is so that the work of the Lord can continue from generation to generation. Amen? Another thing I realized from the text is that there's no excuse for us not to take mentorship in seriously. Because Eli, he wasn't perfect. Eli had faults. He honored his sons more than how he honored God and he failed to restrain them. But yet, he was able to impart something to Samuel. Sometimes we feel like, boy, I'm not perfect. So there's nothing in the church I can do. I can't impart to nobody. No, man. You don't have to be perfect to be able to impart something into somebody's life. Use what God has given you, your experience, your testimony, whatever it might be. Something that you might know, right? You can impart it to somebody else. Um, Eli's family was not perfect, right? So we see that his sons, they were not perfect. His family was not perfect. So your family doesn't have to be perfect for you to impart into the life of others. Some persons might say, boy, they have wife problem. They have husband problem. They have picnic problem. They have what other, other problem? Other, other cousin problem? Brother problem? What other family member you have? What other family member problem? Right? Uh, and they feel that because they have problems in the family, they're not able to impart. No. Even though Eli had family problems, he was able to impart something into Samuel. And another thing I realized is that Samuel was not Eli's biological son. But he was able to impart into Samuel. So you don't have to have a biological child in order to impart. You right? Whatever God has given you, you can impart into someone else. Another thing we realized from this passage is that it's not an easy thing to operate in the prophetic ministry. Remember, Samuel said he was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. So sometimes in the prophetic ministry, you may not want to say the things that God wants you to say. You feel like Jonah, like you want to run away to Nineveh, not Nineveh, to Tarsus, instead of going to Nineveh. But we still have to do what the Lord would have us to say. Sometimes you may be ridiculed or treated badly for what God would have you to say as a prophet. Right? But you still have to say the word of the Lord. Sometimes on, if you prophesy on social media, you may not get many likes. People might block you or hate you because of the word of the Lord that is being declared. But I hear in St. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 to 12, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So many prophets before us would have gotten the same persecution. So we have to speak the word of, Lord, of God. Some prophets like John the Baptist lost their lives, right? He was beheaded. But with the help of God, we can speak the word of the Lord in spite of whatever challenge we may face. So we have looked at the two things so far. We have looked at the sins of the, the sons. And we have looked at the sound of God's voice. So now we'll take a look at the signs of judgment. In this segment, we will look at the reality that God did not just talk about what he would do, but he also did what he said he would do. 
Let's turn to 1 Samuel 4, verses 1 to 22. The signs of judgment. It reads, are you there? All right, I see some person skipping. 1 Samuel 4, verses 1 to 22. It says, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us, and save us from the hand of our enemies. Let's pause here just a minute. Let me explain something before we continue. So they were saying, we went out to fight and we were defeated. Something must be wrong. Let us now bring the Ark of the Lord with us. Now the Ark of the Covenant, it was a box. It was a box that was coated in gold. And it had angels' wings on the top arching over it like this. And there was a pole, two poles that they would carry, the priests would carry it. Inside of that box was the Ten Commandments, there was the Aaron staff that budded, and a pot of manna. So it was something that represented the presence and the glory of God. And in the past, the children of Israel, they would have allowed the ark to go before them and God would do some miraculous things. For example, when they were crossing the Jordan, they put the ark in front of them and the priest was going forward and this big river was now blocking their path from going over to the other side. And then what happened? As the priest's foot stepped in the water, the river started to back up like this and, go, and started to make a heap. And the water was now parted, basically. They were able to go through on the dry land. That's what they, that happened when they put the ark in front of them. Another time they put the ark in front of them was when they were going into Jericho. We sing the song, Around the walls of Jericho, around the walls of Jericho, around the walls of Jericho, the army went. And when the people made a... When the people made a... When the people made a... The walls fell down uh, into Jericho. All right, all right. You know it, man. So what happened was that they had allowed the ark to go before them in that instance. And they marched around the walls of Jericho. And on the seventh day, they made a shout, blowing the trumpets and everything. And the walls came down. So this was what they were trying to replicate. They were saying, no man, we lost this battle. Let us go for the Ark of the Covenant of God. This very important thing that was in the Holy of Holies. This very important thing. Let's go for it. And the Lord will surely give us the victory. Let's go to verse 4. It says, so the people, so the people sent men to Shiloh. And they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubims. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come down, has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We are doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men. Or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Verse 12. 
That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. And he told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died for he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. Let's go to 19 to 22. His, his daughter-in-law, the, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of, the, of God and the death of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. And we pause right there. So brothers and sisters, we see the Israelites, there go, they went into battle, they were defeated. They went and brought the ark of the Lord and, and, and they went into battle. It was a great loss. 30,000 men died, including Hophni and Phinehas. So God fulfilled the prophecy by judging Eli's family. Eli's two sons died in the battle and Eli also died upon hearing the news. So sin can have negative impacts on the family, on the church, and on the nation. Sin can have negative impacts on the family, on the church, and on the nation. Sin makes us vulnerable to the enemy. We are in a spiritual warfare. Look how the Israelites, they became vulnerable to the Philistines because of the sins that was taking place through Hophni and Phinehas. And not only that, we realize that um, bringing the ark could not save them. So outward expressions of righteousness won't save us in times of trouble. There needs to be a change from the heart. So it doesn't matter what we are wearing. It doesn't matter how we speak in tongues and jump. The heart has to be right. Right? It's not just about the ark. So it has to be with the, the position of the heart. And as I begin to conclude in this message, I'm just going to touch a point on... On, on, the, on the three points as we reflect on the gift of salvation. Now, the sins of the sons, just like Hophni and Phineas, we all have sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory or God, of God. So our sins might be similar to Hophni and Phineas or they might be different. But we know indeed that it's a fact that we all some point in time would have sinned. Right? But God had a plan. Now, the, the, the sound of God's voice. God speaks to us through his word and through his spirit. Today, when we read our Bibles, today, when we spend time in prayer, we are positioning ourselves to hear from the Lord. We are positioning ourselves so that God can speak to us. And something that God speaks in his word, he says that the wages of sin is what? Is death. So the payment that you get for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's word, it encourages us to repent of our sins, to turn from our sins, and to believe on Jesus and the sacrificial work that he did for us. So Jesus came to earth. He didn't do anything wrong, but he came on a mission to save us from our sins. And what he did was he allowed them to beat him. 
He allowed them to mock him. He allowed them to nail him up on a cross and pierce his side. And he was bleeding from head to toe with the crown of thorns on his head. And why did Jesus have to do that? He did that because he was taking the punishment of our sins on himself. So God sent Jesus to take the punishment of sins on himself so that if we should repent in our hearts and believe on him, we can have our sins forgiven. Uh, we can have our sins cleansed and we can be made brand new. So Jesus, he was both the priest and the sacrifice. He was offered up and he, was, and he offered himself up for our sins. The final thing in regards to the sign of judgment is that there is an eternal judgment. Now Eli and Ophni's, Eli and his son's judgment was that they died. But there's a greater judgment that is coming. And that is mentioned in the word of God. In Matthew 13 verses 49 to 50 it says, This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see that there is a greater judgment that is coming. A greater judgment that is eternal. It's not just for a time but it continues for eternity. Where their persons will be cast into hell and will be burning and screaming for eternity. And the flame and the smoke will go up forever. But God has made a way for us to have eternal life. St. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So God has a plan for us. In spite of the sins, he has sent a word to say that there's a plan for eternal life. And we can receive this eternal life today. We're going to be doing an altar call. And if, if you're here and you're not a Christian, or if you're here and you're a backslider, I just want to pray with you and to lead you into a prayer that will cleanse your life and that will transform you. You might be online listening to us today and you're not a believer. All of us have sinned at some point in time and come short of the glory of God. But God has made a way for us to be forgiven before it is too late. Somebody say, before it is too late. Hallelujah. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come and live forever. Come and live forever. Life everlasting. Life everlasting. Strength for the day. Strength for Very softly. Come just as you are. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not a born again believer, we would like to pray with you today. Could it show by raising your hand right where you are? I see that hand. As you are. Is there another? Come and see. Hallelujah. Come receive, come and live, come and live. You may be online forever. Just type something in the chat right now. Everlasting. We want to pray with you and for you. Strength, strength for two.
Hallelujah. Could we all stand together at this time? Hallelujah. 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 You're here today. Not a Christian or a backslider. Maybe you're not living the way that God would want you to live. Right where you are, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. As we seek to receive the cleansing of God. As we seek to receive the forgiveness of God. As we seek to receive the gift of eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Lord, he bled and died. He was crucified. But on the third day, he rose back to life again, showing he has power over death. And so, Lord, I ask you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to cleanse me from my sins, to wash me from all unrighteousness, to make me your child today, that I may have the gift of eternal life. These mercies I ask of you today, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for every person that has prayed this prayer today. I pray, God, that by your spirit you will do a work in their lives. I pray, God, that you will draw them closer and closer to you. Have you, as you have forgiven them of their sins and made them brand new, may you sustain them by your spirit. May you sustain them by your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I had a dream last night and I just want to pray in regards to this dream. Father, in the name of Jesus, every person, God, that may be a victim of sexual abuse, Father God Almighty, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will intervene by your spirit. Some are threatened that if they talk, they're going to be in danger. But God, we pray that you will intervene in these situations. We pray that you will grant the boldness, Lord God Almighty, for them to speak out. We pray that you'll bring the right people in their lives that they can pour out to and they can receive their healing through you. May you heal the heart, O oh God Almighty. May you bring justice, O oh Father, in this situation. And may God Almighty, you take full control. May your love be felt. May your grace be felt. May your peace be felt. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. And the people of God say, Amen. amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Salem. I now hand over to our moderator. Amen. basically encapsulate what Sunday school is all about where the word of God is taught very clearly and precisely so that you could understand amen, amen. but also it also shows as it's brought out in the message that God can use a child children to confirm what his his intents are as he did with Samuel Thirdly, as in Sunday school, yeah. there is the opportunity given yeah. for you to give your life to the Lord. And for that person who stood or raised their hand, 
and you can speak to us after the service. Amen. But as we stand, we're going to close just right now. I want to thank our brother for having the Lord use him in that way today. Amen. To clearly speak to us so we could understand from the book of Sir Samuel, the sins of the sons of Eli, the sounds of God's voice as he spoke clearly, not only through the prophet who spoke to Eli, but also through Samuel, and then the signs of God's judgment, which is certain and it is sure. And as we have the opportunity today, don't let it pass you by. So I want to pray today, finally for those persons who God have been tugging on your heart to become active in Sunday school, whether to be a worker in junior church, because there we need volunteers. We want junior church, but we also need volunteers who are there consistently and are dedicated. And also we want to have a Sunday school teachers who make themselves available and committed and be consistent. And as I close today, that's going to be my prayer. Let us bow heads. I just want to do one more thing. Just join the hands of the person next to you. Join as we together join and pray the closing prayer. We want to pray as we close also for Brother Denton, our musician, who uh, had a, a misfortune with his toe, so he's not well um, today. Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. Thank you for speaking to your servant, Newton, Lord, to us so clearly, Lord, and so precise, Lord. And that message came forth to us, showing us, oh God, that you control the universe. Yes, you do. And you ought to be served. And Lord, we must honor you. And Lord, we must live holy lives. Because, Lord, you will judge us. You are the ultimate judge. Despite, Lord, what we want to do, as the Israelites infuted, Lord, brought the Ark of the Covenant, Lord, thinking, oh Lord, that the symbol could save them. But their hearts were far from you. Oh God, change us today. Yes, so Lord, we'll not just come, Lord, to do duty on Sundays, but Lord, we'll come with a sincere heart to serve you. Yes. I pray, Lord, for everyone this morning, Lord, who may be desirous, Lord, of serving our Juna, in Juna, in Juna church. Speak to their hearts, O God, as you spoke to Samuel, O Lord Jesus. Yes. Lord, speak to those persons, Lord, who will be interested in becoming Sunday school teachers, Lord. Yes. Speak your word clear, Lord, even in the night, as you spoke to Samuel. Yes. Yes. But also, Lord, provide a confirmation yes. from someone who will confirm your word. That it is you speaking. Yes. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for a great day in the house today. Yes. Oh, Lord, we pray for a dent on our musician, Lord, that you will touch his leg where he yes. hurts, yes. where, Lord, he has an issue. Minister to him, oh God, and, Lord, that he will recover yes. to come back, Lord, to take his position yes. as our musician. And, Father, we pray for our pastor who may be traveling this afternoon, Lord, from, from Clarendon. Cover his family, Lord. Cover yes. them, Lord, as they journey on the road, Lord. Yes. And may you continue to be with us. Lord, we pray for those online, Lord, who, are, who joined us in service today. May your hearts continue, Lord, to may they continue, Lord, to pour out their hearts to you as you satisfy them with your word yes. and your spirit. Pray, oh Lord, for Sunday school leaders, the superintendent, and the committee members, yes. the class teachers, Lord. And Lord, as we break for Sunday school, Lord, this morning. Continue to be with us, O oh Lord, for we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And the grateful church, give the hand, God a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. So we're going to do the doxology and the benediction. And I know many will remain for Sunday school. Praise, praise God from
us raise our hands for the blessing. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, immortal, invisible, be honor, glory, dominion, and power, now and forevermore. And the people of God say amen. 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 God go with you. God keep you. And be with us for Sunday school. Amen.